to a certain degree, it's, it's a humbling experience because you're like, this can't mean that much to them, you know? But seeing how the world has taken this on, seeing how the movement, is, how it's taken on a life of its own, I realized that they anticipated something great. On August 28, 2020, actor Chadwick Boseman died of cancer. Unbeknownst to some of his peers and to the public, he'd been battling the disease since 2016, since before the release of Black Panther. Chadwick's undeniable charisma and physical presence brought to life one of the greatest black heroes in comics and now in cinema history. This was the type of positive black male representation and a major blockbuster that black audiences had been waiting for. The black women of Black Panther were equally as powerful and important. This was revolutionary. After the passing of Chadwick sent shockwaves through the industry and the world, Marvel shortly announced that they would not be recasting the role of T'Challa and instead moved ahead with pre-production on Black Panther 2. Fast forward two years and Black Panther Wakanda Forever is here. And while not everyone will feel this way, Wakanda Forever feels empty. Having seen the film twice now, there's an unescapable void that consumes this movie. A void definitely left by the absence of Chadwick but even more so by the absence of T'Challa. But this film isn't just missing its main hero, whereas the first one felt like its own epic tale divorced from the trappings of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Wakanda Forever feels like business as usual. So what happened? Hey, what's happening? I'm Purple Boy. You guys are tuning in to Purple Film. Thanks for stopping by to all my returning subscribers. I got love for you and for all the new ones drop a like and click that subscribe button but check this out man we're about to go ahead and get into my thoughts about this movie because i have so many uh but before i do that uh just to let you know this will be a spoiler discussion so if you have not seen the movie right uh or i mean you know if you don't care stick around that's awesome but if you have not seen the movie i'm letting you know right now your boy is about to jump into some spoilers. Wakanda Forever is disappointing. Um, I'm just going to be real with y'all. <laughs> uh, I had high expectations. I had really high expectations for this. And, and, and why shouldn't I, right? Uh, the first Black Panther is an incredible film. I do stand by that. What Ryan Coogler was able to do in spite of the MCU, it's awesome. I will ever be grateful for that, right? It is literally like nothing else in the franchise. Wakanda Forever comes to us minus the heart, minus the integrity of that first movie. The very few of, you know, scenes, uh, memorable scenes or, you know, meaningful scenes that we do get in the movie, they mostly come from Queen Ramonda, right? Uh, Angela Bassett is amazing. She's incredible in this movie and she has some uh, really great, powerful scenes. Her acting is on point. Hope she gets nominated for an Oscar. You see what I'm saying? But yeah, she is awesome in this movie. And that scene, the first scene that we get where she's addressing the Senate and they cut back and forth between that and the first action scene that we get in the movie. I got chills both times I watched this movie when this scene uh, came on. I, w I got chills both times. It is a very well done scene. The height of entertainment that scene, that sequence provided, I was expecting from the entire movie and just never got it. Well, maybe that one scene with Shuri and um, Killmonger in the ancestral plane, that was a very interesting choice and not a lot of people are going to actually like that choice, which is fine. I was on the fence at first, but now I'm leaning more towards actually liking it because it kind of made sense what they were trying to do. Maybe the execution wasn't that great, but 
I get what they were trying to do with that. And so I'm kind of leaning towards more liking that sequence. And besides, again, that scene was engaging in a way I wish the rest of the movie was. Starting off with the movie, we get the death of T'Challa. We get his funeral. We get the whole, you know, set up for uh, other, you know, nations trying to destabilize Wakanda. And then we get the introduction of Namor and the people of Talucan. And I'm telling you, all this stuff happens within like the first 20 minutes of the movie just to kind of give you an idea of how much is going on. Characters have to contend with the death of T'Challa and Chagwit. They have to deal with the whole another, you know, secret nation that apparently has vibranium as well. Disney wants to prepare us for Riri Williams' new Disney Plus series, so she's a plot device. Then we have to address the fact that other nations are trying to destabilize, uh, you know, Wakanda because it makes sense. They revealed themselves. They have this very powerful mineral it makes a lot of sense then we also have to think about okay well what happened to the black panther is the black panther going to return because yeah that is the name of the movie the plate is already full and as the movie continues more is being added to it and now there's no more room left and now you got to go grab a to-go plate because you want to be greedy I mean, I'm talking shit about this movie and will continue to but I mean I really do encourage people to go Watch this movie because that first viewing, I mean, there are exciting things happening, right? Really cool things happening. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know what I mean, that um, Okoye bridge fight, right? That fight on the bridge was actually pretty dope. And now that I'm thinking about it, it makes what they do to her later in the movie make even less sense, right? Like, why are you putting Okoye, right, in an Iron Man suit? There, there, there's like three Iron Man in this movie, you know what I mean? Like, there is no reason whatsoever the Nigrera should be covered up with CGI armor. I really hope that that is a mistake that is not repeated. Hannah Bleeker returns as the production designer on uh, Wakanda Forever. I love her work in the first movie. Uh, I'm really geeky or nerding out about like set production because i think that shit is cool and hannah bleaker returns for wakanda forever uh to give us those you know dope as uh talakan's uh costumes and the namor's throne uh is actually pretty freaking sweet at least when you can actually see it <laughs> there were so many there were moments in the underwater sequences where i i could not even make out what I was actually looking at, like detail was just completely washed out. I mean, like, yo, that's another L for Marvel Studios is uh, VFX, right? And it's going to be worse when Aquaman 2 and, uh, you know, Avatar Way of the Water comes out and do these underwater sequences way better. I mean, damn, Kevin Feige, pay your goddamn VFX artist, man. Another negative about the visuals is that we never really got to explore in a, a different part of Wakanda, right? We kind of just revisit some of the same stuff from the uh, first movie. Although, I'm not going to lie, we did catch that uh, throne room from different angles. It got to me thinking, did they touch it up or do something different? Because that mug looks real nice. Luig Renosnen. <laughs> Man, <laughs> he returns to score Wakanda forever. And man, he does another phenomenal job. I got to say uh, the score that he has, the, the, the theme that he has uh, for uh, the, the people of Talukan uh, in that beginning sequence is haunting. Right. I, I loved it. Uh, that whole scene sequence actually kind of felt like a horror movie. The score breathes so much life into this movie so much life into some of the biggest most emotionally impactful scenes in this movie and i feel like without it right a lot of that just kind of falls flat the blockbuster parts of wakanda forever are cool but again i mean when you look at those moments in isolation they're cool but within context of the entire movie they break down right 
they feel unearned. They feel like, I mean, it feels like character arcs aren't properly wrapped up or explored. You know what I mean? Uh, some characters seemingly having uh, feelings and making choices that just come out of nowhere. The film is dealing with these monumental emotions, um, but I don't think that it has the complexity uh, to really unpack those, right? It hits every one of those beats perfectly, right? I mean, you're, you're gonna feel something, but I don't, again, I feel like at that point, because of, you know, because of the baggage that this movie has and thinking about the real life tragedy that's attached to it, some of that stuff really does feel manipulative. Another great moment for Queen Ramonda was when she scolded Okoye for not protecting and losing uh, Shuri after warning her uh, that she didn't want Shuri out in the field because she was afraid that this was going to happen. And, and it makes sense. This is her last, you know, blood, right? I mean, she, she, she can't lose her. And, and again, the scene, you know, it was, it was emotional, but a, again, a lot of that had to do with, you know what I mean? Uh, Denai Guerrero and Angela Bassett's performances, I mean, of course, and we also know these characters, you know, from the last film and some of that, you know, what I'm saying animosity of the uh, of what happened in the last movie kind of carries into this scene. But again, man, I'm telling you again, it just it it, it, it doesn't have any substance. It, it doesn't feel like I can truly like the film is not allowing me to really revel in this moment and in these characters because again, it just seems like something that's here, right? Because maybe it needed to be here uh, to have that appearance of, you know, seeming darker and way more serious. And like, you know, this is the second chapter. So we have to up the ante. We have to up the, you know, the mood or up the tone, right? We want things to be serious. Big things are happening. And a big thing does happen in this scene. Okoye is stripped of her rank, right? How does she feel about that? You know what I mean? How does she, how does that moment correlate with, you know, how she feels about the death of T'Challa? You know what I mean? Like we do not explore that with Okoye's character. We don't really take that dive into her character. I really wanted after that scene and even the relationship between Queen Ramonda, uh, between her and Queen Ramonda is like, that's a fractured relationship. Like. Just so many things, right, left, you know, unanswered or unresolved, in my opinion, and I was left really unsatisfied, even though the scene, again, in isolation is cool, I was ultimately just left unsatisfied by it. The more I talk about it, and when I was working on this review, I'm like, bro, am I expecting too much from a Marvel movie? I kind of think I am, but it's Black Panther. Right? It's 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 Black Panther, it's Ryan Coogler, I know he's capable of it. And that movie had already set a high bar. Okoye and Queen Ramonda aren't the only characters that really feel underdeveloped. I mean Nakia, man, again, she had such a great presence in the first movie. She comes into the second movie barely in it, right? She doesn't we she doesn't even really show up until like an hour into the movie. Like what? Ditto for my boy M'Baku. M'Baku does have a cool scene with Shuri. He plays this sort of big brother to Shuri. Uh, you know, he says like, hey, you know, your brother told me to look out for you. Offer wise counsel. And he does do that. He offers wise counsel. And, you know, he is that sort of, well, what can I say? That that, that sort of black masculine presence that the film needed, right? Uh, you know, I mean... Yeah, that male presence is, isn't there necessarily, but M'Baku does offer that uh, here. But again, why why was there so little screen time for him? Tanakh Hereta does a good job as the more. Uh, I liked him. I liked the character. I liked him as a villain. He was pretty badass. He was fucking these mugs up. I'm like, damn, this dude is not to be trifled with. I just wish that things that he did in the movie actually made a lick of sense you know what i'm saying i'm just like 
the whole movie, I'm like, why the hell are you even doing this right now? I mean, when you think about it, you know what I'm saying? The whole thing between, you know what I'm saying? The whole thing between the uh, people of Talokan and Wakanda, right? I mean, on a social and political, you know what I'm saying, level, that whole conflict is muddy at best. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the CIA is right there, right? You could have had them become the villain and maybe they teamed up at the end. I just, I'm, I'm really baffled by the choices made uh, with Namor. I think the most egregious thing the movie does is not give Shuri a proper hero's journey. I feel like she was kind of stripped of that. Uh, her hero's journey in this movie was nowhere near as in-depth as T'Challa's from the first film. Um, I think that thinking about her journey in this movie, it just feels like the movie spends so much time wanting to do so many other things that it forgets that it's essentially telling another origin story. Even when Shuri gets to mourn or actually talk about how she feels about the death of her brother, it's immediately followed by a major plot event. And I'm like, man, the brevity of these scenes are just, I don't know, man, it's crazy. The the, the, the longest or the most time we kind of get, uh, you know, thinking about T'Challa or whatever is at the end of the movie, right? But then after the credits end, that scene is then followed up with them teasing another T'Challa. I and many others, I'm sure, thought that the title of Black Panther should pass on to uh, Nakia, right? Lupita just had the physical presence, right? The physical presence and the gravitas uh, to lead, uh, you know what I'm saying, an action film like Black Panther. Uh, Shuri's character, Letitia Wright, was more, you know what I'm saying, princess than warrior princess. To my surprise, Letitia Wright actually does kind of pull it off. I mean, barely, right? And the writing of her character, I mean, it just, it, it nearly undermines her entire performance. Not only is she Black Panther for like the, I don't know, last 10, 15 minutes of the movie, or 20 minutes or whatever of the movie, which honestly, if you watch the previews or any trailers for this, you've seen every scene the Black Panther is actually in. But in addition to that, right, there's a turning point for her character. And who she is after that is completely different or is not the person who we just spent two hours with, right? And so that, development just felt it felt rushed it felt you know what i mean it felt clunky that is just another example of this being more like the mcu product that we've come to expect right where anything truly meaningful is drowned out by the sound of the machine churning out more content in real time like damn can i finish this first Chatwick's passing hurt. I don't even know the guy, but I admired him. I respected him and I was entertained by him. I try not to put too much stock into actors and famous folk being the moral standard, but my guy seemed like an outstanding human being. He was the picture of black masculinity I'm constantly striving for his work ethic, his encouraging speeches and interviews, his humbleness. Again, I do not know Chad, but his career, his life had a profound effect on me. He was my first choice to play Black Panther because I was already privy to his work. But when he did become Black Panther, he was like next to Martin Luther King when it comes to influential black figures in history. His passing hurt. And knowing that T'Challa would not be recast was devastating. So not only do we not have Chadwick anymore, we lost who is essentially the first black superhero of a major blockbuster franchise. Like, where can you go 
in the world where there's a group of black folks and they don't know about the Wakanda Forever salute. Chadwick left a gaping hole in this movie and instead of filling it with something of substance, we got a hollow sequel in the shadow of its former glory. For real though, I mean, I'm glad people are really loving this movie. And if you're on the fence and you're not sure if you should go see this, you should definitely go see this. Despite my feelings on it, it is the movie event of the year. For the fellas who are worried that this movie doesn't have like a strong black male presence, like, you know what I'm saying? The black male, black men are somewhat absent from this movie. Um, side note, there are some metosphere niggas. I mean, these assholes are just gonna hate this movie right because of women regardless so i'm not even like whatever but to the real niggas <laughs> uh yeah i mean again outside of the the few cool scenes that we do have with uh mbaku yeah that black male presence kind of isn't there at least not in the way that it was in the first movie but that doesn't mean you don't support the black women who are and have always been the forefront of this uh, franchise, right? Uh, since the first one. And so, yeah, I mean, their their stories matter too. And like I said, they're great in it. Uh, I mean, I honestly, I do believe that, you know, a lot of black men are out supporting this movie and actually loving this movie. So don't believe everything you read on the internet, kids. Hey, yo, man, check this out. Go in the comments and let your boy know what did you think of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I want to hear your short review. Uh, click that video you see on the screen right now. And the next film you watch, man, I hope it encourages, inspires, and entertains. Thanks for watching.